Kochi, City Poets Story. Let me introduce our guest for the event. Our first guest is Mr. Avik Chandra. He's a business advisor, CXO coach, and speaker at the Outstanding Speakers Bureau. He's also a poet with two collections, Jokhun Videshe, Prodiva, and Kochi. Cheers, man, to his name. Next, we are happy to have Mr. Vinay Sharma. He is a theatre director, actor, scenographer, and writer, active in Calcutta theatre since 1991. He is currently the artistic director of Padavi. Our next guest is Ms. Anjana Basu. Ma is an author, poet, and advertising consultant. The BBC has broadcast one of her short stories, and her poems are featured in various anthologies. Our final guest for the event. Mr. Devashish Lahiri. He is a professor of English literature at Lal Baba College. His poems have been published in various journals like the Journal of the Poetry Society of India, News India, and many others. I'd request our panelists to carry forward this session. Thank you, Ekele, for asking all of us to come here and read our poetry, share our poetry with you here this evening. Yep. Uh, 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 there is no particular order. I, I'll just begin. Uh, I think we'll have about 10, 12 minutes to each. Yeah, yeah. we could do a poem at a time if you want. Yeah, yeah. So that we might have be a, better an hour. Uh, I this thought that since uh, the AKLF, one of the driving forces this year's AKLF, which is celebrating 10 years, is a celebration of Park Street. Uh, so I thought that I would begin my reading this evening with a Park Street poem and also end with a Park Street poem. So. Uh, I'll be reading this, the first poem I'm going to read to you uh, this evening is uh, a poem called At South Park Street Cemetery, which is not very far away from here. At South Park Street Cemetery. The word, kill it, it kill it afresh, even under these feet of grass. Graves converse here, but do not embrace, keeping <coughs> Andrew Marvel's word to posterity. Exiled by earth and word, one cold and dungy, the other warm and salt memory on the palate of time. The names of fathers and sons, of brothers, mothers and lovers, grow estranged as they were in this Eastern life that was cold and salt tears and warm and dungy memory. When a pell mell of voices and hands provoked the sky to thunder. The rain, when it came, lasted three centuries of seasons and was silent and dry. Uh, so, uh, as uh, <coughs> this year is also about, as I said, looking back on the legacy that began, that AKF began about ten years ago. So I thought that, again, I would use that as a theme of my reading this evening before you. So I would go back to my first book, my second book, and my recently published third book, and probably also give you a little taster of the fourth book, which is forthcoming in 2019, maybe sometime in June, July. So I, in order to do that quick journey back and forth, my writing career, I would uh, begin with a poem which is called from a very first collection, First Will and Testament, uh, published by Writers, Writers Workshop. Uh, Professor Amandadal was doing the Desi Shakespeare, and so he was instrumental in bringing, publishing my first uh, book, you know, almost giving birth to me as a poet. The, first, the poem I'm reading is called Aurora Mortalis. After protracted dealings with the moon, when watching becomes dreaming at the vague tether of night, mirrors refuse to reflect protean history's heyday. The pen pushes suppliant hands of papyrus away as mere things are born into this world. Now, the fugitive ink between folds of leather is all a tremble with the tang of death. At this hour, God broods upon the cloud, the leveling of his whole handiwork. But the warm pen consoles the cold paper. 
and a lackey of the sun plays Neptune to the goldfish in the bowl. The light broadens, and again the world is fair. Uh, the next poem I'm going to read is uh, also from uh, this <clears throat> first book. It's called uh, A F Failed Ghost. Share your darkness with me tonight. Or is it day that I darken with your name? Or is it darkness that I make more day by writing moon long lines broken by sun long absences? Let me creep into your darkness, moist like a hedonist in autumn, laughing away the dew. Let me crouch under your darkness, like sad heads under summer rain, flinching from the sun's cool skin of moisture. I imagined darkness as a long walk that ambushes the light in distant windows. I thought darkly, a long interminable syntax of the beating nerve at the root of my new world syllables. I felt darkness in the eye of the candle that recoils from pools of me, carelessly splashed for good rhyme's sake. I felt it like reason that fixes you in its wizard look, or like a ghost that has failed to frighten his morning. short poems quickly. One's called Firing Squad. Last post then. Escape beyond all charges of escape. Things made easy for you when the difficulty is the thought. Summer was like my coffee going cold. Too tepid for a swallow's roosting room. At the cafe, sorry, at the cafe, time was held up by last year's unwelcome frost. And the coffee, never the toast of an epigram, sank the tongue in the sour lingering of a failed curse. Six o'clock. Not quite dark to wipe all the shadows of homeless pigeons in hospitable squares with that tail of light that twitches at five. Escape beyond all charges of escape. Come up in at six, and all that history in the shade of a blink brings the blood running to the mind. It is difficult to think that at six o'clock, blood and mind shall write a new language for a phony apocalypse. And the next one I'm reading is called just merely Home. Home. In this house of stone, a home after my heart. Smooth stone, an erection of light. I walk among the fragments of a life that had once been stone, like a young king among old solitudes, <coughs> through valleys of no feet to the peak of the buffeted footfall. I walk among men, like loss among the fragments of time, striving for a rhyme to reverse my time. In my house, everything deserves to pass away, being my house, because everything passes away. Uh, I will quickly now jump to my second book and read one, maybe two, just for you. Uh, second book is called No Waiting Like Departure. It was a book principally made up of poems written in transit during my travels across different parts of the world and India, of course. I will read two short poems from the Moving Manchester section of this book. The first one I read is <coughs> Skywalk Manchester Airport. Skywalk Manchester Airport. Across the blue skywalk, round which the wind was blowing thick gusts of darkness about, I bore the burden of my travels, like an empty heart does its memory of blood. And another one, very quickly. Train to Preston. A train waiting like time for a passenger 
waiting for waftage, beyond the dark sightlessness of waiting for insight. Stranded, like a poet on a railway station, from where no train would go, the train stood, memorizing its forgotten places, in fear of its destination, endlessness of an end. And uh, I will read one from the Indian section, which is a poem called Stopping at a Signal in Western Uttar Pradesh. As you stop moving, the many-headed grass moves, sways to the drift of a passing breeze, waving, moving, unmoved. Like witness history's windowed eye that records the lie of the land using the mensurations of the sun, peering through its monocle of clouds. A flutter of heavens, chalk on the green, the train, momentarily forgetful of his destination, loitering by the nodding grass and a tall sun. And then, as you thought, all this talk of passing by was like some braggart boasting of his heartlessness, came motion, holding it, now projected by the signal post somewhere ahead, like a barely tolerated rival, into the comfort of distance. Speed came startling him. The painter's canvas, seemingly changeless, hustled into a dying beadnet on the slippery palm of memory. The unmoved train scuttled the lingering finger of the sun and left my pen to stall this passing of the imagined signal post, invented to justify the pause and effect of motion on day's threshold. And I'll read one poem, perhaps, from my latest collection, which is Again, interestingly, a book of love poems of sorts. It's called Tinder Tender, Poems of Love and Loitering. Um, I will read the first poem of this book. It's called A Sea View. The sea on a painter's canvas is a few thumb inches of turquoise. His fingerprint becomes the winds loitering with the water. Could, could, could I just hear that first line again? This one? The sea on a painter's canvas is a few thumb inches of turquoise. I think that deserves applause on its own. Yeah. Thank you, Vinayla. Uh, his fingerprint becomes the winds loitering with the water. The shoreline is a white bone on a white shoulder, softened by desire. The parasol and towel, the silk and the gauze, artfully coaxed into slipping off the fine gravel of skin, till seaweed that the sun has burnt black in memorizing, looks like hair out of place for centuries, awaiting the return of love and the tide. I have looked at the sea over Helen's shoulder for centuries. All I have seen is a sky out of place and a sea out of place. Only Helen Exhaling a sea of Argosies, lost lovers hiding behind the waves on distant shores that refuses to return as the sea she has inhaled and lost forever inhaling is in place. She now crushes the sand in her fist, slowly, like time in the hourglass of longing, with the ardor of lovemaking. Helen's old lovers have perished between azure sheets of sky and sea, all askew-boned, eyes out of place, dying of forgetfulness in hot olive groves of memory. I have looked for centuries at the sea over Helen's shoulder and seen undying love in thumb inches of turquoise. I have not seen the bones of her dead lovers. Maybe my painting is out. And uh, I said I'd read one poem from uh, the forthcoming one, which will be the last poem I'm going to read uh, today. It's again a poem on Park Street, so I return to Park Street again. Unintended, the forthcoming one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would imagine. Uh, it's called Park Street, a cloud study. 
In vain I searched the face of the city for wonders, but found it on the ladder of its eye, the limp right hand of a cloud dangling beside the armchair sky. Long ago, I had seen the limp arm of a man over a chair's arm, lying, lover-like, one upon the other. Levity was not born out of that sleep of arms, only the dead weight of dying that burdens even the likeness of the spirit. This cloud ruminates the city. It must, for only in contemplation can it be so light, no arm or stock pulling it towards the gravity of sunlight. A bird's flight, ricochet of the street's unmindful asphalt and my vision. Lightness descends from the sky. Its conception in my mind makes it heavy. A word would make it fall like a stone. Writing like this about a cloud that does not fear to drop shall drown me. Twilight in Chhattisgarh. The truck dust overtakes the hooves of goats, a veil to drape any bride in extreme soft focus of gritty red dropped to black. Morning is a rock that balances a hard love against a dust blue sky. The the next poem is called The Potter's Lamp. Someone's cupped palm made a light in the potter's mind. His wife trying to kindle the fire, hands sheltering the wild locks of flame, gold spilling through the finger cheeks. Or not that at all, but a blown long leaf letting the raindrops slip down its green slim tip before spiralling in the wind. A cup of brightness, hollows to hold a heart or a light in someone's mind, sparking the trail of a name. She closed her fingers and the light went out. Uh, the next poem... Hmm. It's probably called Kali, but then I never did call it anything. So here goes. To transform a goddess into a gas mask, with the large eyes bulging with a millennium's rage, and the, la and the red slash of tongue twisted into a spiral, round and round towards the source of air, somewhere there in your throat's clenched plea, where a hibiscus magically blooms, stretching out its tongue or breathing, while the rough of petals raised in praise of evil cleanses oxygen while the yellow billows of exhaust fumes and the spume of chimneys waste the land, stagnant, drain by drain. Round the gas mask's neck, a chain of skulls from the cult sacrifices Land fill, land felled, that dripping tube tongue lolls, half in anger, half in shame. Who to blame for it? The goddess saviour cries, fish eyes swimming into oblivion, drawn out by that shout into round circles from brow to bone. The alien form emerging through the smoke, Horse breathing echoing from a million frames. The horror, the horror of that visage. Unreeling all prayers to a dark dancer lost. The image blurred in the appearance of evil. Guardianship disfigured in the beleaguered times passing. Okay, a uh, lighter poem called Milady Sky. The 
first part goes, Sephiris sky, she unbuttons her clothes, a pomegranate spill, splits into a scatter of stars. Part two, moon strip, the moon or the shabir in a froth of clouds lets slip the haze from her shoulders and bursts forth bare and golden as she bathes in the pool of night. Part three is called masquerade. You wear sunlight the way women wear makeup or wish they could. A casual stroking on, a splash on the cheekbones, a wash of gold. Happy or sad, you glow. All the rest is reflection. The dance, the dust motes dance on your skin. Leaning close, I breathe dust and gold. <laughs> One more. Okay, just a sec. I have to change media. <laughs> now you're going to go all high tech, aren't you? Now I'm going to go high tech. I'm sorry. Dazzle us. Dazzle you? No. Oof. I saw freedom, a distant speck, or perhaps it was a star, a needle point so fine it could have been an imagined dream. I saw freedom in ten arms outstretched and armed and reached out to touch, but the world's clay crumbled at my fingertips. I saw freedom in shards and splintered hopes that caught the light when angled right. I saw freedom in the bowing of a bridge, releasing the burden of years, truck by bus by body. I saw freedom. Okay, some short ones. The first tender drops, hesitantly tiptoeing across the grass. A shout from the veranda, rain! and an eager rush to see her. Shyly, she withdraws in confusion and veils herself in clouds. Okay, and the last one. White sun, a searing blowtorch over the jade water. Row by row, the inexorable waves roll over the sand leaving memories and snatching them away again, leaving lost footprints in the sliding sand. The poet's wife, caught in the clutch of water, strains, bent willow, thin a tangle of blue and white, merging with the shifting grains, the struggle of a tree stripped of leaves by the sea's passions. Lovely. Okay, that's me. One last one. one hi, last hi. Hi, hi. Yeah, hi, hi is generally <laughs> hi, hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> she has given herself the freedom to absent herself from the world, keeping a last <laughs> faint thread of contact, so thin and fine that it sometimes slips through all our fingers and then a madness of groping, while she slumbers on some unknown plane where the mind roams free, and reason is a word that asks no questions. The thread of Ariadne through the labyrinth, that glimmer of what ties to what no longer matters, is chaos's last hope. Okay, I shall now shift that away. From the size of the audience is now, by pure magic, gone up by two. Um, 
Anjanadi is perhaps an even tougher act to follow. But I should never that. But, but before starting, um, I know today has been an odd day. There have been mochas and mitchells and traffic jams and parallel events happening. But in spite of that, I see there are about four of us and anything between the shifting population with 16 and 20 of you. So thank you all very much for coming. Right, so I don't have a Bar Street poem. What I do have, however, is a, is a College Street poem. And it's the College Street of my student days. So that goes back about, oh dear, almost 25 years. Um, and that was that was quite an interesting time because India was, the nation itself was, was sort of in a cusp, sort of inflection point, not yet invaded by technology and gadgets and IoT and still quite naive and, yeah, sweet. So, footnotes. It was mostly during the summer months when arriving early before class, we dart across from college, ducking under a sun, that made the street glisten and shimmer like a old heat into a dark building. Then up the stairs, past the first morning whiff at the coffee house, towards the bookshop. But before that, the room on the left where he sat, large spaces around him stacked with books. A proofreader, I thought, or small-time editor. His white head bent over the text, adding a note here and there, never looking up. Light settling like the thick dust on his shelves. And today, that dust turns towards another summer, with nothing but these lines to stand in for twenty years. His white memory, our lost innocence, and all our forgetting. Um, yes, I, I forgot to mention, clapping and hooting are, are heartily encouraged, so long as they're not in the middle of the um, The next one is called Humayun's Tomb, and that's, that's uncanny, because having done poetry and then a novel and then a business book, God help me, um, I'm now finally doing something more creative and constructive, so historical non-fiction. Each time you close your eyes, you look up a sheen of swords. Where their hilts meet, light climbs the palm of the dome. Pigeons animate an irrevocable time. Then a swarm of horses casts after images on your retina. Surrounding the facade, stone scratched with heart signs and lovers' names, you hear their hooves in the wind's ear. The arches bend and grey, like the king who sheltered here when all was lost, thinking, in this place I should be safe, my spirits will protect me. The breath of guns and traitors swims up like shapes in the heat. Now you may open your eyes, they are all still there. Um, I'll do a few love poems, which will also save me trouble of trying to do commentary. Um, this one's interesting because, not just because of the love poem, but because it came out in a journal which is brought out by the Anglo-Welsh Poetry Society. Now, what you should infer from that statement is you would think that predominantly the readership and by corollary the authors would belong to an anglo Welsh ethnicity. Now looking at me, you see how exactly that fitted me like love. Um, it's called Theme in Dry Point. Night and moon wash on a spire, aspire to the state of a fugue, and the image is the same as that of you at the window, your face against the sky's pane, tempering the rain's filigree. Now you and I touch that part where the music 
is borne by the pause between its notes, the words stilled, so that even saying nothing to you leaves nothing unsaid. Another short one, um, still in search of a title. Words of night, for a long time now, I've been watching the sea toss froth and moon shimmer onto the sands, flirt with the shore's single margin. Pieces of ghost and memory mingle and scatter. As the water retreats, a wet stain marks the overture of its latest wave. In flashes, then, I remember how you marked me in your high tide. I do one last one? Two yeah. last ones. No, nah, one last one. Um, so this one is from a, a Bangla collection, which came out years ago. And, <coughs> yeah, it might sound like juvenile, but what the heck. It's called Namhin. Hoito, Amoni, Nodimakano, Hawar, Rath, Chilo, Nisho, Nishka, Chawa, Rath, Chilo, Yokon, Larkin, Klanto, Duhate, Mukteke, Arwai, Bar, Boje, Binitro, Chok, A table at Chorano, Operate Chorno, Polit, Talk to Shop, Chotre, Monte, Prishta Jage, Shudu Ekti line. Beyond all this, the wish to be alone. Shitkale, London, Boro Akaki, Rasta Jonohin, Dalekuno Pakine, Bipote Shoru Borite Pristi Mulin, Chorapata Jorohai, Tenzo de Ashe, Sweety Resh, Bigoto Bertutine Resh. Akashi story story on to car, Arture Opare, Purishe Gari Siren. Al Maji Maji Bore, Michi Ashar Halai, Kunuak Namna Jana, Mayabi Alo Ashe, Ede, Jehabe Kokunuba Gongar Pare, Beshe Ote, Mito Debi, Bashane Kichupashi Rat Pore. Um, so this one's called The Water Cellar of Seville. So I've taken the title from a very famous painting by uh, the, the Spanish painter that I've and tried to do a, a personal take on it. Pathos in drops of water amidst the heat. So when the red marks on the pitcher have nearly dried, choose the tender dark shade and subtle brush. Stains trickle down, if anything. Like tear shine on your cheek at dinner, expended, then brushed away. Now I look into your eyes again and find my cup empty. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Even 700. 
And I found that the best shows have always been when there have been fewer people. Because you reach out in a way uh, which you don't when there's a larger audience. And what you get from the people is a support which somehow equals perhaps a thousand times the actual number that's there. And I think that's the thrill of poetry readings because normally we don't find multitudes. But in such a nice, intimate setting, we can actually share what we've written which is from our hearts and, and what we've just heard from the three of them. Uh, somehow, I was able to focus so much more on it in this setting than I would have were this a large auditorium and uh, were you know, all of you having to sort of share your attention with all that's going on in the auditorium and all that's going on here. Having taken my two minutes out of the 15 minutes of faith that I was out here, uh, I shall try and read you a bit. At the heart of all love, there is grief. At the heart of all love, there is grief. Grief remembered, the anticipation of grief. The blood coursing through the veins of grief is love. Could we just have a little bit of silence, please? Excuse me, that distracts me. I'm so sorry, I'm an old man. If I must read, I must have silence. So sorry. At the heart of all love, there is grief. The grief remembered, the anticipation of grief. The blood coursing through the veins of grief is love and only love. If you know this, the whereabouts of all moments are easy to determine. If you know the addresses of grief and the addresses of love, then you are there, where you are, at the core of the moment, in its stomach, hungering for the next moment, and then the next, with that insatiable hunger that only grief knows. Only love knows. And that knows only you. I'll read a slightly long poem right now because I may not have time to read it later. I shall try and read it over the coffee machine. This one's called To the Human Race. Undated memo from the creator. To the human race. Undated memo from the creator. I wait for you to recognize me. It is a ploy, a measure of my extension that I evade, I change as you near me. Where I was not, where I was, but where I am not. I do this because I seek protection from your God. To be protected from, not by him, and from the images he holds of you. I will not be bound by them. I wait for you to recognize this. I await your recognition of me in this. Though my ways are not ways that have ever been cognizable by you or your God. He with whom you wait at the bus stop, at crematoriums, at airports, at cemeteries, at hospitals, at playgrounds, and other places of departure or significance or arrival, creating signs and journeys where none exist. He with whose hand your other hand washes the dirt off the clothes of your days. He whose body wastes for you, whose promises infiltrate the innocence of your hopelessness. The facility of whose books can be rewritten according to the availability of your words. Who embraces you as a knife embraces its edginess with sharp nervousness of design. He who lives in your breath, kneels in your desire, <coughs> turns in your pain, then leaves everywhere you arrive. 
until you recognize this, me and me in this, I stay threatened, but yours truly. Thank you. A short point quickly. The monotony. This one's called The Daily Dude. I feel like a piece of faltering wood, creakingly uncertain of its purpose. The day goes by like a banned commercial vehicle, deadening my mind with its deadly emissions. The governments of the day still stand debating the validity of some law or other as I sit, slip, sip, unordered. Fright has me by the balls, faint but noticeable. Give us our daily pain, the nearby mosque wails, while the temple opposite rings with hysterical laughter. Every night I try and sleep corrected. Thank you. Are you okay with the long one? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, this one's called burning out. I'll give you a short one to start with, to end with, whatever. This one is called Mind Rock. If you've ever been at a rock concert, yep. either listening to the performers or performing yourself, it's called Mind Rock. Sharp stabs on the lead guitar, the throb of the bass, the sound hovering over the one breath crowd, the songs are here, are here living by our feet, scurrying, licking at the music as it falls in concert with our souls, kicking at the evening, the drum heart beats, everybody's blood is in my head, everybody's blood is in my head. Thank you. I'll finish off with a long one. One last one, is that okay? This one's called Autumn. And I should sit for this. Because there's a page to turn. The book I write is not the book I know. I write without knowing. I write without knowing. I write without knowing what I write will become. I write without knowing which line will change into a thing, without knowing which line will transform into a character, a thought, an explosion. Which line will remain, remain me, remain written, without knowing, remain real. The book you write is not the book you know. You know the others. Your best work is always in the book that you tore up. The book that you never wrote. The book that you knew, the book that you forgot. Not the book that you write without knowing. You know the others. The book that you lost. The book you stole. You know the book that you loved. The book you betrayed. The book that you mourned as you were thrown about from book to book. Thrown about from book to book, thus you were always a line being written. Not aware of the line before or the line after. You wrote without knowing. I write without knowing. I write without knowing what I write will become. Which line will remain written, remain me, remain real, remain... I write without knowing if the line magically takes leave of my hand or if it is being devoured by an author at the other end of the line. An author at the other end who draws the line, who draws the line at nothing. Who will draw the lines from my hand till the hand is empty of lines. I write without knowing from where the line travels 
and to where. I write without knowing which way the line travels. The arrow of time, confused, seeks my guidance. I pin it down with the point of my pen and spin it. Spinning in all directions, time becomes a blur, instantaneous, unimpressionable, bereft of all lines, I write without knowing in the book that I leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone, thanks to the poet, really indeed the poems have made us travel so far and so we wouldn't end this session yet, we have some more poets coming in to join the session, yeah, to join the session, so we'll continue it with all the poets in here and then I'll invite the poets who are at the moment waiting in the cafeteria to continue with the session.